Ladies and gentlemen, the American Jury and Bulldog Nation, welcome to the inaugural The Bulldog Show. I'm grateful to have Dr. Charles Melman, Cincinnati pediatric spine doctor, as my first guest. But until then, let me just share a few thoughts. We are here on election eve. And it's not just the battle for the country, it's battle for the states of Ohio and all across this country. There's a battle for the United States Senate, there's battle for Congress, there's battle for state legislatures, there's battle for the courts. And guess what? Two weeks ago, what did I prophesize? I said that between Trump getting COVID and recovering, Hunter Biden's laptop controversy, and his serial rallying as Biden continued to have gap after gap, that that combination would build momentum for Trump. Then what happens? We have a 33% jump in GDP. You put all that together, Trump has all the momentum he needs to win this thing in these last two weeks, and that goes all the way through to election day, which is tomorrow. And I still am calling it, Trump's going to win. I don't care what the margin's gonna be, I just know he's gonna win. And I remember I said this, everybody's, oh, everybody's mind's made up, mind's made up, mind's made up. How many times has your mind been made up about something and then you changed your mind? That's been happening over the course of the last two weeks. And not only that, we all know that the early voting, not the mail-in voting, the early voting is going big time for Trump. In Florida, they're, they're going crazy about what's happened in Miami. Not enough of those Democrats are getting out to vote. There is zero enthusiasm. Yesterday, Sunday, I watched Trump in the cold, in the cold of Michigan, just give an incredible address, incredible, with humor, his videos, 30,000 people. Where is that enthusiasm for Biden? as he and Obama go on a tour of honking cars. It's kind of embarrassing. So ladies and gentlemen, the American Jury and Bulldog Nation, if you haven't voted, get out there and vote because it matters. And again, Trump's gonna win. When we come back from our title sponsor, Dieter's Law, you're gonna hear from Dr. Charles Melman, and I think you're going to be very interested in what he has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Jury and Bulldog Nation, why should you hire Dieter's Law for your legal matter? Well, to be candid with you, Dieter's Law is unlike any other law firm in the country. So why should you hire Dieter's Law as opposed to any other lawyer? Well, it's really this simple. They fight for you. Theodore Roosevelt said, aggressive fighting for the right is the noblest sport the world affords. I believe that. Dieter's Law believes that. At Dieter's Law, you're going to have someone who fights for you in an unorthodox fashion, unlike other lawyers. Most lawyers don't care about you. They only want the fee. Dieter's Law, it's always a cause for justice. It's always David versus Goliath every single day. Yet, they win. It's been proven. In a year and a half, Dieter's Law secured nearly 100 million in jury verdicts on 40 cases. That is unprecedented anywhere in the country. That takes money, that takes hard work, that takes organization, that takes passion. And Dieter's Law delivers that. Not only from the attorneys, but from the entire staff. And that staff includes me. I may not be licensed to practice law, at the moment. Why? I retired in Ohio and I'm in the process of being reinstated in Kentucky. But you know what? None of that matters. Why? I'm able to work on your case no matter what. So when you come to Dieter's Law, you get the Bulldog and the team that I assembled. If you ever need to hire an attorney, hire Dieter's Law. They're unlike anyone else. Contact Dieter's Law by contacting me. 859-250-2527 or eric at ericdeters.com. Text, call, or email me. I'll make sure you get in the hands of the right attorney. I'm honored today to have a very special guest with me, Dr. Charles Melman, 
who this might shock you by looking at him, I call Cowboy. Welcome to the inaugural show, Cowboy. I'm honored to be with you, Bulldog. Uh, Dr. Melman, you are a pediatric spine doctor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And before we get into the lawsuit that you filed against Cincinnati Children's and the reasons for it, I think it's important that we tell the ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, who you are. You were born in West Virginia, correct? Yes, that's where the hospital was. And you lived and you grew up in Belmont, Ohio? It's Belmont County and it's uh, Bel Air, Ohio. So it's very rural Eastern Ohio. Okay, is it north, south, where is it in Ohio? Pretty much the middle, right across from Wheeling, West Virginia. Okay, so how did you become a doctor? What, from growing up on a uh, farm in yeah. Belmont County, Ohio, yeah. how did you get to be a pediatric spine doctor? I think the, sh the, sh the short answer becomes pure luck <laughs> uh, and followed closely by hard work. Uh, so I was very, very lucky to have an incredibly supportive uh, parents and structure around me. I was the first to go to college in my immediate family. Um, and um, I don't know, paying attention. My mother taught me to, uh, to strive to excel academically. You know, my father taught me the value of what it means to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go to work. Um, and I would like to think I put those things together and made it happen. Where did you uh, go to medical school? I ended up at Ohio's first university, Ohio University. In Athens? Yes, sir. Home of Ken Brew. I think Ken Brew went there. They have, a, they yeah. have, I think, a broadcasting school that's pretty popular there. They claim Ken Brew, and they're very proud of him. Yeah. Um, when did you first start working at Cincinnati Children's Hospital? So I uh, finished the, the tail end, you know, medical school training and residency training is a long process. And that finished up at the tail end with a specialized fellowship in pediatric orthopedic surgery. And that would have been in 1996, 1997. Okay. Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, I think I can speak for our entire community. I can, I can speak for the world. Uh, they have built up over the years an incredible reputation uh, for pediatric, as a pediatric children's hospital. Absolutely. Um, comment about that. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible gem. I mean, it is one of the strongest uh, strong points of our entire region. It, it, it attracts uh, just not locally, but regionally and nationally and internationally. So it is an amazing institution. I always say that uh, here in the greater Cincinnati area that we're blessed that if you are injured by trauma, we have UC Health. If you have a cardiac issue, you got Christ. If you've got kids, we've got Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And I think it's important for our interview that the issue of whether or not Cincinnati Children's Hospital is an asset to the community is not in question here, correct? Absolutely, it's an incredible asset. Okay, now, Dr. Atik Durrani was a Cincinnati pediatric a spine doctor that started work, orthopedic doctor, that started working at Cincinnati Children's, I believe in January of 2005. Will you take us through from the time that you first encountered Dr. Durrani or started working with Dr. Durrani up until the time when you started expressing some concerns about Dr. Durrani? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, Dr. Durrani, he was first exposed to us at Children's Hospital also in the context of being a fellowship, uh, uh, an applicant and then a, a person that completed our pediatric orthopedic surgery fellowship. He was an international graduate that came to us in the late 1990s. So I was just a couple years, several years into practice when he came through. Um, after he finished a fellowship with us, he went and did some other training at some other locations. And then he made a very big decision that some international graduates make, and that is to repeat his orthopedic surgery residency. He had already completed a residency in, in the United Kingdom. Um, but that isn't recognized by the licensing boards of the United States. And so in order to be board certifiable, um, he, did, uh, he did a really big thing. He repeated his residency at University of Cincinnati. Okay. When did you first become concerned about what you were witnessing with Dr. Durrani? Well, uh, we, I'm, I'm a nerd in many different ways. And one of those... Oh, cowboys aren't nerds. Yeah, well, in, in my family, that's, that's a, you know, like being compared to a dog is a, a compliment. We love dogs so much. <laughs> you know, being called a nerd is a compliment in my, fam in my family. Um, but I had done additional training in evidence-based medicine. I got a master's of public health uh, to that end. 
Um, I was very involved, uh, and still am, in, in the academic side of my uh, specialty. Um, and I am an educator. We spend time educating orthopedic surgery residents, medical students, and as I've mentioned a couple times, uh, pediatric orthopedic surgery fellows. Um, I am a board certifying, I'm a, I'm a doctor that participates in the board certification process. I go and evaluate doctors in other areas of the country, watch them operate. I help create the examinations that they take to pass their boards. So I'm in a, then and now is in a strong position to evaluate what are the core you know, uh, uh, concepts, what are the core, what are the core uh, uh, standards for the specialty. And what I saw, uh, to your question, uh, was uh, a wild change of, from what had been the normal case at our hospital uh, to an area that was very, very different. What was he doing that was different than the other pediatric spine doctors? Well, there was a wide variety of, of things. There were certain um, procedures that were once incredibly rare uh, that were then, there were explosions of those procedures. Um, um, there was a, a procedure that involves a localized fusion of the lower lumbar spine in a child. And previously that surgery had been done, like in my own practice, I'm going on you know, 25 years, I think I've done it twice. I had a senior partner with closer to 40 years of experience. If he had done, I don't know, less than, less than 10 is what my estimate would be. Um, the, the, the surgeon we're talking about, Dr. Durrani, was doing four a day. Um, and so it was a wild, wild change for that particular procedure. I got to see subsets of this as they were presented in um, some of our teaching conferences. And so you got a feel for what, um, what was being done. And then certain complications started to arise within the hospital that were also very, very unusual. And I, I did strike a note of caution regarding those things. Did you start to speak out internally at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in your department about what you were witnessing and what was their response? So the answer did I speak out was absolutely yes. I spoke out early and often. Uh, I would, by 2006, um, um, I was definitely was speaking up early and often. And the response was still what I have referred to as the low point of my professional career. Uh, through, through channels, um, I was told, um, and asked to be quiet about such things. And what I said then is, and I've testified to this as well under, <laughs> in a deposition, I said, you know, the day I'm quiet, you better check a pulse. You better double, you better check for sure. Because as long as I sit in this room and we review these cases and we're involved with teaching these residents and fellows, I'm going to speak to the standards of care of our specialty. Did, what did Cincinnati Children's Hospital do as a hospital around Dr. Durrani that they weren't doing with the other doctors? Oh, the short answer is a lot. Um, there was a dramatic change in how things were managed in our division and the sort of arrangements that were made for uh, Durrani as a practitioner. Uh, we had a, a subset we, we were blessed with many, many strong nurses at Children's Hospital that supported our care in the outpatient setting. You know, as many surgeries as were done in the hospital, we still were seeing around uh, 20, 30,000 outpatients, you know, per year. So the doctor doesn't show up and see that by themselves. You need strong support. Uh, so part of that support for our, the, the spine portion of the practice were spine nurses. And those spine nurses would attend the outpatient clinic and see that, you know, there's lots of other care that we deliver besides surgery for spine patients. There's bracing and physical therapy and, and all sorts of other things that we were able to offer. Suddenly, those nurses were withdrawn from those clinics and they no longer supported the non-operative care of spines. And their sole focus began priming and, and facilitating the process of getting patients booked and ready for spine surgery. I'm, excuse me for sounding, uh, I'm going to ask you a serial question. Like like I'm going to sound like an attorney. Imagine that. Was Dr. Durrani doing, un, in your opinion, unnecessary spine surgeries? That is a, so the answer is there was a mixture. There was a mixture of things that were clearly uh, within the standard of care 
um, and uh, were reasonable reasons to do surgery. And then there were cases that were further and further and further out on the fringe. Okay. Yeah. Did Cincinnati Children's Hospital benefit economically from what they were doing with Dr. Durrani? Oh my goodness. The answer to that is an absolute yes. I mean, that's part of, of, of testimony that's out there under oath that he was the number one money-making surgeon within the entire hospital. Dr. Eric Wall was your department's chairman during this time period. What did Dr. Eric Wall tell you about Dr. Durrani? So um, the doctor that you mentioned, Dr. Wall, was the division director, um, is the, 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 the title for his uh, being in charge of pediatric orthopedics. But he was the one that delivered that message to me that I already, already said, you know, Chuck, you've been asked to be quiet. Did he use an expression of describing Dr. Durrani? Did he, did he use a psychological term in describing Dr. Durrani? Yes, um, that, is, that is true. Um, yes, he did. And uh, that's, something also, that's something else that's also been testified to within a previous deposition that I gave. He used the term sociopath. Um, and um, from my understanding of that word, that diagnosis, that was an appropriate label. And um, it was uh, sad but true. Now that we've laid the groundwork, I want to dive into what happened to you. Um, the law firm that was handling these cases started requesting your deposition. Uh, they actually subpoenaed you for a deposition uh, that, that Alan Statman took. You were subpoenaed to testify at a trial that you testified in. I want you to tell the world what was happening to you inside Cincinnati Children's Hospital as these requests for you to testify in Dr. Durrani and be subpoenaed which is the basis of your lawsuit. Tell the world what was going on inside the hospital. Well, I, I appreciate the question, uh, Bulldog. The, um, you, 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 you preface it by talking about, by, by alluding to how many times my uh, testimony was requested. I was aware of two, of about eight to 10 requests for my testimony. You, now, you know now that there was a whole bunch of requests for it your testimony. It was disturbing to see how many times that it was requested and there was a clear effort to repress or prevent me from telling the truth, uh, which is uh, what I eventually got the chance to do. Um, and during that time when things began to heat up. I mean, there were federal agents that came to Cincinnati that were involved with uh, asking questions about different aspects of uh, the Durrani practice. There were these requests for my deposition. And what I got, what I experienced was a serious, a series of serious efforts uh, of what we would call systematic retaliation. I mean, I worked a solid 14 or thereabout years with no complaints, uh, I'm very happy with my practice location, and suddenly things changed. Have you ever been, how, how many years have you been at Cincinnati Children's Hospital? I'm proud to have been working 25 years in practice. Have you ever been sued for medical malpractice? No, sir, and I got a knock on the wood for that. I'm very proud of that as well. I've never even had a serious safety event evaluation. Have you ever had your license, medical license suspended? No, sir. Okay, so here you are doing your job, and all of a sudden, these things, what were some of the things that, that are described in the lawsuit that you filed? What are some of the things that they did to you specifically with these programs that they asked you to go to and whatnot? Well, there was suddenly, uh, there, was, there was complaints leveled about some nurse complained about me in the operating room, often people whose names I didn't even know. So when you're working with strangers, it's hard to work immediately cohesively, especially if you're doing very difficult operations. It puts people who are unfamiliar with what's going on in a bad situation where they feel uh, inadequate uh, to be provided to be functioning as a OR nurse or scrub tech in the OR. And so what I said, I was the same person that I was then as I was the 14 years before that. But suddenly there was now, uh, there appeared to be an ability, there appeared to be a, uh, an agenda uh, that related to taking any of those complaints and magnifying them as much as possible. 
Did you voluntarily show up for your deposition in the Durrani cases or was it by subpoena? I was subpoenaed. Did you voluntarily show up to testify at the trial uh, or was it by subpoena? Subpoenaed. So you did all of this by order, by a subpoena? Yes, sir. By, by order, I was asked to tell the truth. Okay. Um, how did this affect you? In other words, how did some of the things that they were doing to you to clearly try to suppress you from coming forward, how did that affect you? Well, it was, it was stressful, and it still is stressful. I, you know, I, is it still going on? Absolutely, it had to stop. Um, you know, and it's creepy how you can take certain events, uh, whether that be a, another request for a deposition, testimony in a trial, and then you could match it to the next effort at what I would clearly call retaliation at my hospital. So every time that there was some kind of step where it looked like you were going to have to testify or do something, internally they did something to you. Sometimes it was connected. If it wasn't the same week, it was within a couple days. Before filing a federal lawsuit, what steps did you take to try to, you know, not go down that path? I mean, did you try to resolve this without having to take that kind of severe action? Um, absolutely. I, I love the people that I work with. I have awesome nurses. I have great partners. I've had an incredible practice location. I have an, uh, very loyal referring doctors uh, over these 25 years within the, the great city of Cincinnati. And uh, I can lay out at least five different steps along the way where I just said, what can we do to de-escalate this? I thought I did this. Uh, back in 2018 when I had uh, legal representation that communicated with the hospital that laid out a bunch of these facts that you and I have discussed. Mm -hmm. And they said then, they said, hey, we see a clear pattern of retaliation here against Melman. Um, that apparently still wasn't enough. Okay. So you, filed a, you have filed a federal lawsuit against Cincinnati Children's Hospital for retaliation. Are you still working there? Yes, sir. I've, for some of those very reasons that I said, I've got great nurses, I have fine partners. Um, I'm doing my best to continue to take care of the patients in my practice. What did you want? In other words, what did you want Cincinnati Children's Hospital to do before you ended up filing this lawsuit? What did you, what'd you want them to do? I, I guess you could simply say I'd like to have been left alone. Left alone. <laughs> I'd like to just go to work and do my job. You, you and I, and this is, I, I'm so honored for you to be willing to do this interview because I want this show to be about airing so many things about injustice in this country that don't get aired with the mainstream press. You and I share politics, but we also share something that's unique to most people that share our politics, and that is this corporate world out there and how I've, I've coined the phrase, I need a, a trademark called a corporate slave. Mm -hmm. What's it like working in that environment when they come for you? It's, uh, it's uncomfortable. Um, and you are without, without legal representation, you are completely outgunned, um, so to speak. Um, you and I are talking now really about what I call the ugly, you call it a corporate slave, I call it the ugly underbelly of corporate medicine, where fam patients and families don't know how muzzled their doctor or their surgeon is when it comes to their ability to speak up about safety concerns. I think people would be shocked if they had a complete peek behind that curtain. From my, I mean, I have lots of doctors who are friends. I have doctors. I talked to them and every one of them would echo your concern that medicine now is corporate health care and they own the physicians. And it's not necessarily a good thing because the emphasis becomes on profits instead of patient care and what you just said, patient safety. Well, and there's a, there's a, a tremendous corporate focus on message and uh, avoiding bad press. You know, here we are in late 2020, uh, hopefully coming out uh, the back end uh, of this COVID crisis. And how many examples are there across the country of where doctors and nurses spoke up 
about their hospital's policy or uh, at that given time or a lack of protective equipment and suddenly those people were were fired you know I, I guess they're still blessed to be in the united states because the same people that did the same sort of things in china they just disappeared uh, but in the states there were clear cases of where institutions retaliated again again corporate medicine against people who spoke up we can sum this up really clear which is this in america today in the healthcare system that if you find out there is something wrong you can pay a heavy price for speaking up and you have to choose many times speaking up or career for example i'm aware i've been made aware that there's for nurses there's this little uh depository where nurses get labeled not for rehire and a nurse can get blackballed and will never work in this quote unquote town again if they speak up they threaten them with that say you'll never work in this town again because those hospitals go to that same information bank and it's it's really scary it shouldn't be that way should it not at all because uh, the you know and a super important part of the backbone of the American healthcare system is clearly our amazing nurses. Um, the stories that I'm, the highest profile stories that I'm aware of mainly involve surgeons um, and there are incredible stories of abuse and retaliation from California to Michigan to Massachusetts to Texas. Uh, some of these incredibly high profile and very disturbing cases and now we have our own incredible uh, uh, situation with 500 plus lawsuits uh, with uh, the Dr. Durrani debacle. What happens when courageous people like you and others don't speak out? Um, I don't know how those people sleep at night. You know, what I've always said through this one thing is absent um, having my job threatened, um, as I have, um, I've slept rather well at night. Um, you know, you talked at the beginning, I'm an old farm boy. Uh, I'm an old Boy Scout. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> a, I'm an old 4-H club president. <laughs> you know, I'm born... You're on, red, white, and blue, flag-waving American. I'm born on Washington, I'm born on George Washington's birthday. So, uh, I was raised a certain way in, you know, in the Appalachia, um, in, in the country, and I don't know any other way to live. Well, Doc, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Best of luck with the federal lawsuit. Best of luck with your care. I, I think you're a hero for what you've done. And more that. people need to do what Dr. Charles Cowboy Melman is doing. Thank you very Thanks. much. Appreciate it.